Well, boy, I said, Dad, I came home from school, Dad, and I caught my mum dead. <laughs> Sitting on the settee, Dad, with the milkman, Dad, that was kissing and cuddling, Dad, all afternoon, Dad. I said, don't tell me now, son. Tell me tonight when we're watching television and your mother's there. He said, I will, Dad. So we're sitting watching television. He said, I got something to tell you, Dad. I said, what is it, son? He said, I came home from school, Dad. I caught my mum, Dad, sitting on the settee, Dad, with the milkman, Dad, that was kissing and cuddling, Dad, all afternoon, Dad. Just like you with me, Auntie Margaret, when my mum was in hospital. <laughs> How are you? Monday. The day after the night before. The day after the night before. I can't tell you the amount of people that have asked me, are asking how it's gone, how it's gone, how it's gone. It's almost as if you were there with me. It was brilliant to hear. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much for all the uh, all the kind words. How did it go? How did it go? Well, to be honest with you, for all those who went, I bet you smashed it. No, didn't smash it. Didn't smash it. I didn't down my arse either, which is another big point, but I definitely didn't smash it. Do you know when you're a kid and you grow up and you're watching films and the films always have like a storyline of adversity and then people come through the adversity and at the end spectacular finish and it's, it's succession and everyone succeeds and as you grow up as a kid you think that's actually how life is but as you go through life you very soon need to learn or need to realize that's not how life is uh, it doesn't work like that and uh, well not in not in most people's cases anyway and certainly, in all truthfulness, not in mine. Um, I want to share a couple of stories before I go on to actually how it went. And for those that you don't know, I'm talking about the, my uh, premiere as a stand-up comic. I did a show last night in, um, on Golf Sur and uh, in front of about 100 people. And I'll tell you about how that went in a second. But uh, before that, I want to tell you a couple of other stories about how... Because I've, I've told you before I've had three different lives, but it's how those three different lives all started themselves. The first one you know, I was a professional golfer. I was a young kid, 19 years of age, and I started in my first ever professional tournament. My first ever professional tournament, I've been playing since I was 11 years of age to get into become a professional. And my first ever professional tournament, funnily enough, was actually at my home course, Sale Golf Club in Manchester. And I'm actually playing my first ever tournament there. I've squeezed, scraped everything to try and get into this tournament because uh, I didn't want to miss it and I managed to get it, I managed to get in. I've been working there for a couple of years, or about a year and a half, so um, I've played the course, like I know the course like the back of my hand, and I started in this tournament, professional tournament. It was an assistant pro, because I was an assistant professional at the time. Uh, the path of the course is 71, for if you're a golfer, it means uh, a scratch player, zero handicapper, should get around his 71 shots. I went out there, my tee-off time was about 10 o'clock, I remember it as clear as day, and Par 71, I shot 89. I shot 18 over par. I absolutely gassed it, like you wouldn't believe. So much so to a point where one of the administrators of the PGA, who was a family friend, uh, was in the bar that evening. And uh, I was around the corner, he didn't know I was there. And he was actually talking about me uh, in quite a derogatory fashion. And he was like, how on earth can a lad assistant at his own club he wants to be a golf pro, get in his first tournament and shoot 89. What chance has this kid got? And uh, I heard it at the time, didn't say anything about it, but I heard it. And it stuck with me, even to this day, I still remember it. Anyway, what happened two years later is uh, I'm playing in the same tournament. It was a yearly thing, two years later I'm playing in it. Same par 71, and I go around and I finish second and I shoot 69. I do a 20 shot difference swing. And I went up to him, and uh, he, remembering he doesn't know that I heard him, I says, can you imagine, two years ago people wrote me off, and uh, if I'd have believed in that, being written off, I wouldn't be where I am today, taking second place and taking a cheque for 900 quid. Thank you very much, up yours. And then I went into car sales, later on down life, and I always remember I sold my first ever car, didn't, know what I was, didn't even know what I was doing really, but just following the process, I sold my first car. And my first car that I sold was a Vauxhall Mariva. Second hand car, Vauxhall Mariva. Sold it on the Wednesday, and they were coming to pick it up on the Friday. And with it being second hand, it was like three years old. I had a couple of little scratches on the front of the bonnet. And the guy says to me, he says, uh, silver car, he says, can you sort those scratches out on the front of the bonnet? So I'm asking my boss, because I don't know. I said, can we sort these scratches out? He's like, yeah, yeah, don't worry about it, we'll get all that sorted. 
Signed back going, yeah, yeah, no problem, we can get that sorted. So on the day of delivery on the Friday, the guy comes up to pick his car up and we do all the paperwork and he goes out to look at his new car and he goes, those scratches haven't been done. Those like chips, they've not been filled in. And I went, because I didn't really know what I was doing. I was like, oh God, yeah, you're sorry, you're so right about that. So I went back off to my boss and I said, uh, these scratches haven't been done. He's like, did you do this, this, this and this? I went, no, no. He says, well, they're never going to be done if you never did that. Well, I didn't know, did I? I didn't know. So anyway, we had lucky, we had a painter on, um, on site on the day. The painter used to come twice a week and it was Friday, he was there on the day. But he wasn't there, he sent his assistant along. So I said to the assistant, I said, look, I've got a couple of chips on this bonnet, can you just fill them in please, just in silver? And the guy went, yeah, yeah, no problem at all. So the customer's in the showroom, sat at the desk, looking out the window at a painter who is touching his bonnet in. And what this guy does, this painter, is he dips his brush into this little black nail varnish pot. He bends over the bonnet to actually start touching it in. And as he bends over the bonnet, he pours this silver paint out of his like nail varnish bro um, bottle all over the black front grill. And we're all watching him do it. And we're going, what on earth? It was a little bit of a dreary day. So then what he proceeded to do as he proceeds to get his cloth and wipe, try to wipe it off and all he succeeded in doing was smearing the paint all the way across the bumper all across the front grill and just making the job worse next thing you know the guy picking his car up is in the office with my boss demanding he gets a new front grill brand new my boss is luckily he's been a bit more around the block and he's like no no that's not happening you're not doing that we're not doing that so uh it didn't go according to plan my first ever sale of a car consequently from there though i stuck with it and within two years i was the uh, i was in the top three used in the country for used car sales for Vauxhall for the Vauxhall division so i succeeded through adversity so, with those stories in mind, I think you've got a bit of an idea where this is going to go then, of how it went last night. And I'll tell you how it started. It started as we left the house. We were driving down to the Gulf from uh, Callao. I purposely chose a place away from town because I wanted somewhere to practice. In hindsight, I'm now not sure whether that was the right idea because I think the people, the audience, are not the type of audience that will generally get the style that we're doing. I always said to people like, um, for instance, Eminem, the rapper, he would fill Wembley Stadium 10 times over, but he wouldn't fill Dylan's because it's not his audience. So. That's the first start, but I wasn't too fussed about that. I thought I might get a mix of residents and holidaymakers, even if I get some holidaymakers. I might have a chance with it. I didn't. I got, out of 100 people, let's say, 99 were residents. So I went, oh, fair enough, if that's the way it is. Let me just check, see if this is still on. Yeah, we're still on. So 99 were residents. So there's the first part. Driving there is a 20 minute drive. As I'm driving there, I'm looking over to my left and I'm seeing for myself many 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 black clouds and I know the island and I'm looking and going that is directly on the gulf we're in this sunshine like this but I can see the black clouds and going that doesn't look very good so we're checking the weather apps Shelley loves the weather app she went, no you'll be fine it's fine it's fine so anyway turn up there Shelley is more nervous than me I'm not really nervous I, I think I come prepared so I'm not really nervous about it I get up there, start off, first five or ten minutes, well, first five minutes, maybe a little bit shaky, to be honest with you, but then I get into it. Now, I was telling you before, the first half an hour is the talking bit, so it's no props, no aids, no nothing. So it's where you're most open and you're most exposed, let's say. Um, and it was doing all right. And after 15 minutes, I was actually getting into it and then the heavens opened and it absolutely teamed it down. 
So, a hundred people got up and ran for cover. And the thing about comedy is you need to connect and it's you and them. And that connection just broke straight away, just gone. So I had to stop, We had to because we had to save the electrical gear anyway. The speakers, the sound desk and everything's all outside. Sorry, I'm walking up another big hill. Ten reefs on a hill. So the rain, the rain came down. So it was a 10, 15 minute um, interruption there. The reason why all this started was about a year and a half ago. There's a, com there's a comedian on the island called George King who was actually on The Comedians years ago. Remember those, that show in the 80s? And I spoke to him about it and said, look, I'm thinking of doing stand-up. What's the best way? And he said to me, so look, if you want to do stand-up, become a compare first of all. So I've literally followed this almost like apprenticeship path without really telling anyone. The only people that knew were me and Shelley. And uh, she also said, look, you do a compare. You're a compare all day long. So I did that, but also in the hindsight that I knew that I wanted to be, in the end, a stand-up comic. So he was there tonight, last night, he was there. And he came over and he said, look, you're doing, you're, doing fancy, you're doing great. Didn't know how much it was just like nice words or how much it was actual criticism. Or just, you know, just smooshing. Well, thank you very much, George. But he said, look, if I was you now, I'd stop because you've lost them now. Because of the weather, the way it is, you've lost them. So after about another five minutes deliberation, not knowing what to do, do you know what I thought? Do you know what it is? I'm not going to stop because my strongest bit is actually the second half of it. It's not really the first half, it's the second half, the strongest bit. So I went back on and uh, I did the second half. The trouble is, I got the engagement back in again, but obviously out of the 100 people, I made it to the top of the hill. Out of the 100 people, there was... Uh, Maybe I'd lost 20 of them. They'd just uh, disappeared because of the weather. But, I'd, you know, I got them back on. If anything could have gone wrong yesterday, it did go wrong. Because also in there, which I didn't tell you about, we had, I had two hecklers. All day drinkers, one on the left, one on the right. One on the left thought he was a right funny arse, which he wasn't. He was just a pain up the arse. And the one on the right was just downright insulting. And I had to handle them. But again, when you get it, I was like, oh, OK. I've worked a year and a half in Dylan's. I've had about two hecklers in a year and a half. I've now got two on one night on a premiere night of trying to do a stand-up comedy show. So I had to address them as well. I didn't, while I'm thinking about how to address them, I thought, how hard do you go in there? Now, the one, the one on the left was, was just trying to be funny and he wasn't. He just kept shouting stuff out and he wasn't funny. So I just turned around to him. I said to him, mate, do us a favor because he was insulting to me as well. I said, look, do us a favour. Be nice to me like your wife was half an hour ago in the toilets, will you? <laughs> Got a bit of a laugh, shut him up. The one on the right was really so insulting. I just ignored him until the end and then went to him afterwards when he's in his, when he's in his friendship group. And he's absolutely, man mountain of a bloke, but absolutely shedded, drinking all day. And I just went over to him and he had, he, he just, as I'm, I had to walk past there to go to the toilet. And he, he just said, he had another go at me. I'd have just ignored him, but he had another go at me there and then. So I just turned around to him in front of his group, excuse the language. I said, mate, you must have missed the memo, because it was my turn tonight to be paid to act like a not yours. And that just shut him up. It actually made him really quite, uh, I'm not going to say aggressive, but it made him, uh, he definitely felt it. And the rest of his gr friendship group just told him to shut up. But that's how bad it was. And for the necessity for me to say that to somebody just gave it in my head of how, uh, how bad it was. So I had those two things going, one on the left, one on the right. That was happening. Because of the rain, the next act had turned up. The owner of the bar says, look, get on quick. Let's get, get you on, because she's like, then she had to set up. So she was all over the stage in my way as well. So it, to be honest with you, as I said to you before, if it could have gone wrong last night, it did. So in the circumstances of everything that's gone wrong in it, I'll say the performance for me was 65%. Solid six and a half out of ten. It wasn't crap. It wasn't amazing. I got a fantastic text last night off an entertainer who says, congratulations, you've done it. Bless you. He says, congratulations, you've done it. You got it under your belt. From somewhere I didn't expect, which was lovely. And I've got all your messages of people here just saying, 
well done fantastic which I really appreciate as well so the question is what now well for me first of all it's just now pull it back off the gas again and more reflection on it and see how it goes I think that's what it comes down to and then just take from there it's not dead and buried the challenge was accepted for myself I, I challenged myself and I accepted the challenge and I completed the challenge but where it goes from there I don't know yet I will tell you something though and this is the truth is I cannot tell you how comfortable I was getting back on stage at Dylan's last night at nine o'clock being in your own space and being in your own comfort zone there's a lot to be said though for putting yourself out there and giving it a go and I'm quite proud of myself for doing that as well so Tiger Woods turned pro and won his first major the moment he turned pro I didn't win a major last night but I did have a mini victory anyway so that's what it comes down to for those that are following this thank you so much and I hope you've uh, I hope you've enjoyed it I hope you might have got something out of it stick yourself out there it doesn't matter I was on from seven o'clock last night and I always knew one thing from seven o'clock for an hour I always knew that 8 p.m. would eventually arrive whether it good bad or indifferent 8 p.m. would arrive and it arrived so much so now that it's 20 past 12 on the following day go for it if you want to try it just go for it what's the worst that can happen as always see you on the next one guys cheers <laughs> Oh, I went to school with an Irish lad. This Irish lad, he was good at woodwork. Two years woodwork. And he made a poker. <laughs> this is a silly bugger. You've got an electric fire. <laughs>